So we're going to start the session with the second speaker, Professor Dustin Cowell, uh, who will speak on the collective actions or collective action in opposition to timely uh, portrayed in Arabic literature throughout history. Professor Cowell. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here and have my paper selected for presentation at this great uh, conference. In this uh, paper, I have chosen four texts which I feel represent this motif, starting out with uh, the pre Islamic age and then going into um, the mid 8th century in one of the first works of Arabic prose literature, Khalil Abidna, and then proceeding to, if time to, uh, to two novels, Egyptian novels, by, one by Bergwa, um, Bergwa Ashur, uh, and another novel by Ala Asmani. So you all have, hopefully, a handout that I prepared. Which from the peace on the page. So this is an idea that swept across um, the art world uh, since January 2011. It's this idea of collective action by people in opposition to tyranny. And this uh, observable then, this idea of a kind of a group spirit which binds people together is visible throughout history. And I would now like to look at how we see the idea of a group spirit of and collective action as we find it in the pre-Islamic age. And there's this body of poetry called the Mualaqat, which are the epitome of the uh, great um, poetic um, production of the pre-Islamic age. And I have uh, selected several verses from the uh, end of one of the great uh, Mualaqat by the poet Lavi, and uh, uh, it's, it's 89 uh, verses in this ode, and uh, if you look at the um, handout, uh, you'll see, um, even, if you even if you don't read Arabic script, you'll see on the very uh, left-hand side of the uh, Arabic text, uh, uh, the symbols of Muha, which is the Oran Muha, which is the rhyme for the vertebra of this poem, this modern rhyme food. So these odes all had one single rhyme at the end of each um, uh, verse of this is of two hemistics. Uh, in this uh, excerpt that I've um, presented presenting here, we see, um, first I'll talk about a bit of the scenes, uh, talking about how every uh, widow, for example, who is destitute finds the tribe uh, providing her with the essentials. Uh, even in the times of austerity, when the winds are blowing back and forth, and uh, the, the, the tribe provides for the orphans who come to the uh, food that's laid out in front of them. And it's portrayed as, as if they laid out watering troughs, and the orphans go wading into the water as they wait for the food. Um, then the, the group comes together and assembles, and in, the, in front of that uh, adversity, a leader uh, is chosen, and that, that leader then leads them against all, um, uh, all the stresses that they may, uh, whether it be adversity or, or whether it be an enemy. And this leader then, uh, gives the those who have gives, uh, those who have their rights supports their rights and those who uh, whose claims are not are, are not well supported then he uh, judges against them through the kind of ideal of justice of, of course in, uh, within the own, within the, the tribe itself um, and then he himself this leader is a man of, of, of honor of a great 
generous um, and attaining uh, what he strives to attain. Then it goes to the doctrine, for example, in the 81st verse, um, how these, this noble tribe has its uh, noble genealogy with its forefathers, and they've laid down a, system, a code of laws, a system with uh, traditions which they follow, uh, which bind together the, the uh, members of the, of the tribe. And then we see in line 84 how there's a metaphor of how the, the members of the tribe have built a, a house or a great tent perhaps. Uh, and people, and young and old, come uh, climbing up this, this uh, the top of this house, or this maybe metaphor for this, uh, the great institution that the, that the tribe is. Uh, in line 85 and 86, we'll see how uh, there's an idea maybe of the fates or some almighty force which apportions um, lots to uh, the people. And this tribe has been very fortunate in having um, been a lot of faithfulness as an attribute. And um, they've got a good share of that. And then in the final uh, three verses, this excerpt on another ode itself, um, we, it goes, they, talking about the members of, of the tribe, um, they are the ones who, who, who strive, and, and they are its, its, its horsemen, and uh, they um, are spring, in fact. They are the spring rain uh, to the stranger uh, and to the widows. So this idea, of course, we have this idea of metaphor of, of water, dew, and uh, spring rain, uh, they bring generosity. Um, and, and they also um, uh, stand against the, the um, the ignoble and the enemy, the last word of the the I will now, um, I, the translation I've chosen here from Alan Jones is one meant for students to give the more or less literal meaning, as he understood it at least, but it's a very, there are lots of controversies of all the meanings of all the words. Um, it's not being the most poetic, because most poetic is, uh, but it has a very high literary register, which is difficult to maybe uh, understand. And so I, I'm going to read um, these, this excerpt first in English, the first line, and then go over to the Arabic, so at least you have some feeling of the, of the poetic um, uh, qualities of, of it. And listen to the muha, which is the final rhyme. So uh, starting with line 76, and I've skipped uh, two lines in the middle. Every poverty-stricken woman repairs to our tents, starving like the camel tethered to die, her clothes tattered and shrunken. Tekwi la apna bi guru raviyatin mithul baliyati kalisun ahdamuha When the winds blow from the opposite directions, my tribe can pile up troughs of food spread out into which orphans wade. Wa yukaliluna idha riyahu kana wahat hulujan jumaddu shawari'an heikamuha When various groups meet together, there is always one of us who shuts the door in disaster and is energetic in dealing with it. Both sharing out, giving the tribe its entitlement, and curtailing claims or abolishing them. By his own virtue, a man of honor, giving help towards generosity, Bountiful, attaining and gathering desirable things. Fadlan, wazu karamin, yu'inu ala nada, semfun, kasubu rahabibin, ghanamuha. A tribe whose forefathers have delineated a pattern of behavior, and every people has its pattern of behavior and its ideal. Min maqshirin, sannat lahum abahum, wa nakuli kalman, sunnatun wa imamuha. They have built for us a house whose roof elevation is high, and the old and the young of the tribe have, have ascended to it. Be content with what the sovereign has allotted, for characteristics have been allotted among us by one who knows them well. When faithfulness was allowed among a tribe, 
the one who shared it out gave us in full the biggest share. وَإِذْ لَمَانَتُ قُسِّمَتْ فِي مَعْشَرٍ أَوْفَى بِعَظْمِ قَبْضِنَا قَسْتَامُهَا They are the ones who strive and the tribe is stricken with difficulties. They are its horsemen and they are its arbiters. فَهُمُ الْسُعَاتُ إِذْ الْحَشِرَتُ أُفْضِعَتْ وَهُمُ فَوَرِسُهَا وَهُمْ حُكَامُهَا They are the givers of bounty or the spring to the stranger dwelling among them and to widows when their year of mourning has elapsed. وَهُمُ رَبِيعٌ لِلْمُجَاوَرِ فِيهِمُ وَبُرْمِلَاتِ إِذَا تَتَوَّلَ عَامُهَا They are the real rulers of the tribe and are too powerful for the envious ones to make them late or for the noble ones to join with the enemy in rebuking them. وَهُمُ الْعَشِرَةُ and يُبَطِّ الْحَاسِدٌ أَوْ أَنْ يَلُوْ مَا مَعَلُوْ بِأَمُهَا Now we take, we go down to the uh, great sociologist in Saldun and he described this tribal feeling using the term Asabiya. Ibn Khaldun uh, lived in North Africa, born in Tunis in 1332. Generally considered to be the father of sociology. And then in his Muqaddima, in his great work Muqaddima, he talks about this term Asabiya, which binds together the members of a social unit, particularly a, a tribe. And it has both negative and uh, positive qualities. So here we see this poem by Levine, we see the, the positive of the, the tribe helping one another, cooperation, uh, defying the, the, the enemy. But also it can lead to um, chauvinism. And so that can be, uh, so Islam saw that as a danger too, that you have different tribes fighting one another, each with their own asabiyya. Uh, so, uh, if it's only limited to a, a tribe and you speak to others, then it can be negative, although it has positive force within the tribe. And then, of course, in Islam, you have the, the Ummah, which could probably, uh, in the same feeling, could then grind together people of different tribes, of different, uh, uh, in their own diversity. Um, and we see that um, in the early years of the uh, Caliphate, I can we might take the capacity of how, what tore these, those, those governments apart were these different asabi or different uh, feelings of different uh, uh, groups. Because you have this idea of, well, we're superior to others because we're descended from, some, uh, from the Prophet, for example, and you're not, you're not really like us, you're, you're of the of Persians, or you're not. So we have this kind of conflicts of the, of the different kind of asabi. Now I'd like to turn our attention to a great work, um, uh, Khalil Adibna. And this is a work that uh, had its origins in uh, ancient India. And the, in this book we see how it's related how the king of the pre-Islamic uh, king, uh, ruler of Persia, heard about this great, um, this book for, uh, for kind of a guide to kingship. And he asked one of his, his ministers to find someone who uh, was a new, new Sanskrit who could go to India. And uh, so he found a scholar, went to India, um, was able to uh, copy the book there and translate it into uh, Persian. And then brought it back. And so we see um, here this uh, illustrated manuscript from uh, which was dated to 1354. Uh, this is um, a measurement of, of the work Kaliba did not. And we see here the, um, the scholar going uh, off to, to India. And then he's in India and he's uh, meeting with the scholars there and who helped find the, the book from the Royal Library. He's able to then uh, translate it into uh, Middle Persian. And then he comes back to the court and um, the minister um, of the king then uh, writes a bibliography about, about this scholar and, and relates that to, to the other people at the court. Now we have in this, uh, this book has many uh, fables. 
And they, the characters are animals who, who think you talk like human beings. And then we have the story of the uh, ring dove. Now, the, a, a hunter come along and spread out seeds in the ground beneath a tree, which a crow was, uh, uh, was perched. And they didn't notice that, they, that the, the net there. So the uh, doves uh, went to get the seeds and they got ensnared in this net. And they found that they were going to be, they're just the, 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 the hunter would come along and take them up. So the, the leader of the ring doves, and it's all feminine here, tells her sisters, we've got to cooperate, get together. We've got to save ourselves together in the spirit of cooperation. Let us all flutter in the same tempo, the same unison together in unison, so we can lift up our net and fly to another safe place. And this is what they do. They all flap their wings in unison, but they can fly up in this net, and we're going to go to a place where I have a friend, the rat, and he'll be able to gnaw the, the, um, the, the net so we can uh, free ourselves. So then um, uh, they get to the... Um, that place and the, and the rat, uh, as pictured here, uh, comes and gnaws. But the, the leader says, don't free me first. You're my friend. You'll get tired and forget about my sisters. Take, go and free all my sisters first before you free me. So here we have the real leader that thinks about the community and not about his or her own personal uh, welfare. The crow that sees this and is very amazed by this, uh, uh, well, the, for them, the, not only the, the lead green dove, but also the rat, uh, who is that way, is, I'll be, befriend him, I won't, you know, try to attack him and eat him, but I'll just make him my friend, and he'll come in a good time in the future. So then there's also, in the story, we have a, a white an antelope and a tortoise. So we have four friends, which you hear this drawing of the, the antelope, the crow, the rat, and the, um, and the tortoise. Well, then the, a, um, one day the, uh, the antelope is lost, they can come back uh, to their pond there, and, and they, so they find out that the, the, the antelope has been ensnared by the hunter. So how will the friends help this hunt, help the, the, the antelope? So the, the rat goes and gnaws and, and frees it, but the tortoise doesn't, can't get away fast enough, and it's fast enough to lose the hunter. So the antelope says, okay, I'll lie down with half the hunter as a decoy. And uh, then uh, when the hunter comes along, um, he will uh, look at me and try to get me. Uh, and then there'll be time for the tortoise, for the rat, uh, for the tortoise to walk away in the time and save himself. And the, the crow is also involved in licking the wounds of the, uh, of the wounded uh, antelope. And um, here we see in this, in this uh, slide uh, the antelope uh, posing and the, um, the rat and uh, trying to free the tortoise um, from the, um, the snare. Siraj, which I will talk about. Uh, 
Siraj that takes place in the Madhya Island, um, somewhere between uh, Zanzibar, East Coast Africa, and uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And here the, uh, the title is the Arabic word meaning lamb, which has a metaphorical meaning. The, the Arabs of this island are slaves who are persecuted by this cruel sultan or sultan. And one of the um, young men, or well, just a teenager, uh, goes off to Egypt on a merchant ship. When he wants to go back to a ship in Alexandria, he finds that the ship is gone. Why? Because the British are attacking uh, and bombarding Alexandria. His good friend that he met there in Alexandria showed him around and talked him about uh, the stories of the Sindhavan and different uh, stories from um, uh, the Yaka tradition. He has been killed in this um, uh, attack by the British in Alexandria. Finally, this um, protagonist gets back home uh, and then he participates in a kind of uh, quiet revolution against the cruel Sultan. Uh, they will, they, of course, there are two uh, major um, communities under the rule of Sultan. The, the Arabic speaking um, sailors and fishermen, and we have then slaves who have been enslaved, they brought from the coast of Africa, and they live in their home by themselves, and they're not supposed to even intermix with the others. But uh, Said is the protected able to um, behave with the slaves, and they uh, inspire to uh, attack the, the Sultan's uh, residence. And um, so he is also seeing this. Uh, confronting of the, of the British in, in Alexandria. Yeah. So, uh, at one point, at the end of the, of the novel, the, all the people get together carrying lamps and uh, march onto the uh, uh, residence of, the, of, the, of the, the, the Sultan. But what happened, they, they're almost victorious. They, they, they free the, 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 those imprisoned by the Sultan in the dungeon. What happens? They're bombarded from the sea with their friend. Why? Because the British would come and made a treaty with the Sultan to have a base. They now come and uh, kill off all the, most of the rebels. And so here we see this idea now that the, we have evil in two forms. We have the, the evil which is the puppet of the British, uh, the, the Sultan, which is even his own self-desires. He's forced by the British to, to allow them to make a, make a, have a base. Uh, and then when he's in trouble, then of course they'll come to his aid, not worrying about the uh, legal, uh, or the rights of the people. As is also the idea of the British coming in and occupying <coughs> and Egypt. Um, you have also kind of an Indian government that's not so great with the, uh, the, uh, the local rulers. Um, so it's, it's a kind of a parallel. We see then the people coming together and uh, getting together. And the nice thing here, we see the different the first people come together in cooperation, both the slaves, the, uh, the Omani, uh, those who were sent from, from Oman, then uh, facing this tyranny. But again, at the outside, the imperial force is the, uh, the evil. One other, well, just one other, um, okay, fine. So the uh, one last one I'd like to discuss is um, Chicago uh, by the uh, writer Alain Aswani. Egyptian writer, who was um, very, um, was very was very critical of the Mubarak regime. Was, I think he was part of the movement called Messiah. That's enough. We've had enough of him. And this novel describes the a community of Egyptian students studying at the University of Chicago Medical School and uh, traces the uh, the thoughts and the lives of, of these students. But it. Um, one student in, 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 was, had an office in Egypt and had um, not been able to get a, you know, uh, not able to get a post there because of uh, the corruption there, even though he was a very talented person. Guess, uh, and one of the uh, professors there is, um, had uh, a girlfriend who was very um, active in opposing the, the government and the administration, but he was always a kind of a coward and didn't want to get involved. And then it's his chance when the Mubarak was to come and visit uh, Chicago to make a speech. Um, and it, we're supposed to um, extol the president, 
that's a script. He with his friends said, let's go ahead and just and let's have them have it, tell them what a tyrant he is. Of course, he gets up to the podium, he uses his courage and, and does it, and they will not be able to carry out that. Um, so we have a very uh, strong um, criticism of, of the Bardic regime. I just might mention that um, even the Mabel Stirad, written in about 89 or so, uh, we now see bloggers looking at that, and one uh, uh, blogger wrote in March, this is just like our revolution. Here we come together and we have toppled uh, the evil sultan of Mubarak. So I'll end with that and thank you for your attention. Uh, 
uh, attempted to secularize the state, especially the judiciary and educational systems, by reducing the influence of Jainistan, the powers and effect of Jainistan, and, and removing, removing the departments that were connected to Jainistan and putting them under uh, the control of a secular uh, government. Now, looking more closely at the intellectuals, Ziya Gökhalp is portrayed as the father of Turkish nationalism even under the Turkish, new Turkish Republic. Uh, he is viewed as, uh, again, the, the founder of the, the, the idea of Turkish nationalism. He got his education in France, he studied there, and he came back with ideas of a, a Turkish nationalism which was more based on uh, culture than territory and and in, especially in in the uh, journal Islam once he outlined uh, components of uh, a, a combination of nationalism and Islam uh, in in a state in the ideal state as he envisioned he used uh, the various aspects of Islamic law Islamic jurisprudence, and he attempted to come up with an argument that would justify uh, the idea of a Turkish nation, a secular nation, a secular state, based on uh, the principles of Islamic law. Some of these uh, I was happy to hear was addressed by uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasr yesterday too, uh, the concepts of Nas and Earth. Uh, these are recognized actually in Islamic law as they are both a part of the Islamic law. Uh, Nas referring to the divine text and earth referring to, according to Ziyad Yoka, this was a reference to the social conscience, the traditions of a society. Uh, he wanted to see it as social conscience which is reflected in the practical aspects of the society. So, in his view, there were these two bases of Islamic law, both were legitimate, both accepted each other. Uh, but in order to make the... Uh, in order to um, make the religion, make religion as alive, uh, a part of the living society, uh, he came up with the, he emphasized that earth uh, had to precede Nas. And in order to show that he, he, he worked on the concept of every remark of Nehi Ali Munker, this was also mentioned in last night's keynote speech, basically enjoying the good and forbidding evil. And he focused on the word Maruf in relationship to earth. So since earth refers to social conscience, Maruf it would be referring to what is known as good by the society. So, earth means, yes, he associated the term maruf with the principles that the human faculty deems acceptable, and then munkev in this uh, phrase would refer to the ones that are rejected. So he put the social conscience, the understandings of the society at the core uh, of his methodology, legal methodology. Another intellectual that I would like to discuss further is Halil Sabit. He was originally a Kazan Tatar who studied Islamic law in Istanbul. Uh, he published his uh, travels to Central Asia in Turkey. So he was more, he, he, was, he, was, he had his studies of Islamic law, but he, in terms of his ideology and his writings, his intellectual production, he moved uh, towards a nationalist. Uh, direction, and he was more associated with the national circles, so he, he is generally portrayed as the protege of Ziya Yuka. And in, in Islam Mejmasa, who he directed, um, he published both the ideas of Ziya Yuka and his views on, he expanded on the ideas of Ziya Yuka, especially on these issues of uh, Earth, Maruf, uh, and Nas, and how they relate with each other. And so I propose that when acts regarding life are reinforced by revelation, it is only due to the living continuation of earth that the revelation can meaningfully survive. 
When Earth changes and the society's perception of that act turns from good to evil, then that act does not continue to be affirmed by revelation. This is, I think, a critical issue to understand. This is just a picture that I took when I visited Harisabi's village. Uh, this was probably the mosque where Harisabi got his earliest education in Russia. And you can tell that it was a very cold, very really snowy time when I was there. So basically risking my life going to that village. And the burnt mosque to me represents uh, the combination of the, the Tatar culture uh, passing through the Soviet influence. It was burned out of the Soviet time and never uh, reconstructed. But going back to Halim Sabit, uh, he published his views between 1914 and 1918 in Islam Mejmaasid. And the motto of Islam Mejmaasid, the magazine, was religion with life, life with religion. And this is best represented again in his writings, in his discussion of Earth and its role and its relationship with us. So again, uh, as the society's perception of certain acts, according to Adam Sabi, changes from good to evil or evil to good, that change precedes uh, revelation. Then the act, if it changes to be evil in time, then it does not continue to be affirmed by revelation. An example that he presents is almsgiving. And this is a very commonly mentioned example in most Islamic jurisprudence texts in, in referring to the change in, uh, in the norms and legal determinations. The Muad those whose hearts are to be reconciled, at the time of the Prophet, they were to be, uh, they were a part of the group who could be given alms, the obligatory alms, and the zakat. And this is established with a verse in the Quran, although there is no later verse which notifies this revelation, during the rule of Abu Bakr, the companions of the Prophet discussed whether uh, this verse should be continued to be practiced, and Omar uh, later on abrogated this practice, for there was no more need for it. Adam Sabit uses this example how a change in condition in the society, a change in perception in the society could later on affect the practice of a revelation uh, to bring up Earth uh, sort of above mass. Uh, and he argues that it was a change in Earth, people's positive perceptions of that act, which resulted in the notification of the revelation. Now, of course, this, sound, this may sound like an abstract discussion of Islamic legal methodology, however, it has very critical practical implications. And they were very much aware of these implications, and they actually deliberately brought up these legal uh, discussions to lead to those practical changes and transformations in the Ottoman politics. A question that here arises is whether they envisioned a society uh, like post ottoman period, in my readings, they really, uh, their whole attempt was to transform, was to reform the existing system. So their acts were considered to be changing the existing Ottoman politics rather than establishing something dramatically new. But the, the implication of employing these this earth as the central Islamic legal principle was that the state established on national principle, could uphold the traditional law, the general understandings of a society and culture, and this would constitute the earth. Thus, the office of Sheikh Islam, the office that we discussed in the beginning, was not necessary for Islamic jurisprudence. But what was critically, basically necessary, since earth has to be taken as a principle, uh, the core principle, it would be just a parliament that represents the people and the society. The society's views would be represented in the parliament, and that parliament would be, from an Islamic standpoint, justified to, uh, to come up with uh, decisions that would be, again, part of the Islamic uh, legal uh, procedure. In, in the, he published these views in a series of articles, and in, in Islam Islamic 
create a platform for such reformist practices, such as publishing sermons, uh, the Friday Kutmas in Turkish, that was uh, quite a point of contention at the time. Uh, the Quran translations of the Quran in Turkish were also published. They, in those issues, they did not even discuss whether it should be done that way, but directly did it that way and published them in the journal. The idea of women, the role of women were highly discussed and other issues of theology were also brought up in the journal. And in his later articles in Islam Mejmaz, he outlined a state administrative system as he observed in the late Ottoman Empire. So he argued that there were two main branches, as he could see, in the Ottoman Empire. On the one hand, you have the Caliph representing the Islamic, uh, the religious branch of administration. The religious branch is represented by the Caliph, divided into legal and educational divisions, and then uh, the legal council excels in both mass and birth. The religious educational division is structured from top down, uh, at the top being Sheikh Islam. And then it goes down with the directorate of religious education, muftis, wives, hatibs, and imams, uh, to all the way down to the localities, to the popular level. At the same time, the legal branch of administration is responsible for justice, education, and government, and it is represented by the Sultan and the Parliament and, and the Council. In this view, the decisions of the legal branch should have religious legal legitimacy. He, in, there is a really nice quote here. Um, he stated that religion is such a power that only religion can limit itself. Religion itself should state that law is a matter of state. And this approach clearly indicates a separation between the religious branch represented by the Caliph and the legal branch represented by the Sultan and the Parliament. The harmony between the two branches is dependent upon the acceptance of the legal branches acts as legal and acceptable from the point of Islamic law. So this was basically an attempt on the side of Ziya Yukar and Ali Sadi to convince the religious branch, the offices of Sheikh Islam, the other Muftis and the, the Imams, uh, that they should give up the right to pass laws to the secular branches uh, exemplified in that case in the parliament. Besides, these ideas constitute a link between late Ottoman intellectual thinking and the reforms in the early Republican period. Indeed, when we look at how Mazzasad described the office of Sheikh Islam and, and all the top-down hierarchy, this is basically almost the same thing as it is transferred into the Turkish Republican time uh, with the example of the Directorate of Religious Affairs, although the powers are very much reduced, attached to the Prime Minister as an office under the Prime Minister, uh, down from the cabinet level department, uh, it still almost preserved the same hierarchical structure into the Republican period. The theoretical framework which, which made possible the abolishment of the Sultanate and letting the parliament represent the legislative authority, then the, the abolishment of the Caliphate and having the parliament represent Caliphate as well, was laid out in journals such as Islam Mejmaz and by intellectuals such as Yagyakar and Alim Sabah. In consequence, Ziyad Gökhan and his protege, Ali Sabi, aimed at introducing a new interpretation of Islamic law in order to secularize and democratize the Ottoman governance. Considering that these intellectuals work closely with the CUD government, their main purpose in reforming Islamic law was not to argue for a new nation state based on secular grounds, but rather to convince the still strong Islamist elite of the Ottoman Empire that Islam allowed the secularization and democratization of the state apparatus. This approach, in fact, recognizes Islam's significance and centrality in matters of culture and religion, and thus seeks to create a common space where both Islamic and national identities could exist side by side in peace. To utilize the newly introduced terminology of secularism, Ziyan Yukar and Adam Sabit sought to implement 
Passive secularism, as these terms were coined by uh, Dr. Kuru, uh, in a, as opposed to the later imposed assertive secularism in the early, early Republican period. This approach would take a different turn when the Kemalist Republic of Turkey, where a certain secularism created a tense line between the secularist elite and the Muslim population, leading to a hindrance of democratic processes. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Raquel Ann. Friedman. She will be speaking on the Quran versus the secular state on Said Qutb's ideology. So, Good morning. I'd like to note that this paper is a part of a larger co author article that's currently in press at the um, Arab Studies Journal of Georgetown University. Um, spring issue. Um, so this paper examines the views of Sayyid Qutb, the Egyptian thinker, from 1906 to 1966 on Islam and the secular, um, by interrogating the contemporary anthropologist Talal Asas for applications to the secular, both broadly and in his case study of Egypt. So the paper's main argument um, centers on Qutb's subsuming of the secular under the rubric of Jahiliya. Qutb's quasi-historical diagnosis of the rule of Jahabiyya, as he called it, a concept he derived directly from, from the Quran, and more specifically, Surah al Maida, verse 50, and associates with secular, humanly devised systems of government, has lent his work popular appeal despite, and perhaps even because of, its radicalism. This paper examines Qutb's thesis, in which he dismisses man as an inadequate homo politicus, who needs divine guidance for a better life on earth in terms of the complex interaction between the secular, the religious, and ideology. In order to better locate the secular in a photo and investigate whether this location may disrupt or inform or expand current understandings of the secular. In his Formations of the Secular, Christianity, Islam, and Modernity, published in 2004, Talal Asad employs an anthropological approach to trace the rise of the concept of the secular and the related doctrine of secularism. Asad takes colonial Egypt as his focus in carrying out a detailed study of the dynamics and interaction of Arab nationalist and Islamist groups as he poses two ambitious questions. One is, what did Muslims think about secularism prior to modernity? And the other is, what did Muslims today make of the idea of the secular? In order to answer these questions, Asad takes a close look at colonial, the colonial Egyptian court system, as well as touching on other issues like how the word secular and the term secular has been translated into Arabic, and how Islamic performers have responded to secularization. Sayyid one of the most looming names in discussions of 20th century Islamism, and the leader of the Atlanta Muslim Moon during one of its most challenged periods, is markedly absent from Asad's work, and especially from his discussions of Egypt in formation to the secular. In his case study on Egypt, Asad focuses on the discourse of law in colonial and post-colonial Egypt, with attention to related discourses such as Islamic reforms. His reasoning for doing so is his interest in the change in the grammar of relationships between institutions, morality, and law when society is secularized. His broader concern is to address what changes are involved in the shift from a religious political sphere to a secular one. Religion and the secular stand in a complex relationship to one another in Qutb's writings. This tension appears prominently in his works Hathadin and Al Mustaqbali Hathadin, both written after 1954, and in his treatise Mu'ayyad al Qutb, which was published in 1964. Written at close time intervals, these books all present parts of Qutb's worldview, including his views on various parts of history, technology, scientific advancement, religious history, modernity, and other topics that are significant in understanding his overall vision. In these works, Qutb's main focus is distinguishing his vision of what society should look like versus what he defines as jahiliya. Whereas in common parlance and standard religious usage, 
The Jahangir refers to the time period prior to Islam, where people in the Arabian Peninsula engaged in all sorts of behavior that was forbidden in Islam, such as drinking, gambling, and worshiping idols. Qutb concedes the Jahiliya as a, con as a condition in which society does not use Islam as its guiding principle in all realms of life. Jahiliya, for Qutb, a dehistoricized condition, can occur at any time in history and in any place where humans take uh, human rule takes priority over God's rule. And he provided, he applied the term broadly, as you can see uh, in this quotation. So using his own definition of jahiliya, he proclaims that the whole world today is in a state of jahiliya. And even those Muslims living in Islamic societies that consider themselves to be Muslim can be living in, uh, in jahiliya because these societies do not actually use Islamic law as their entire basis of rule. And I quote, There is no Islam in a land that is not governed by Islam or determined by Islamic law. Either there is faith or there is kufr. Either there is Islam or is, there is jahiliya. Either there is right or there is misguidance and strain. End quote. In contrast to jahiliya's true Islamic rule, a state in accord with divine edicts that, according to Qutb, has not been present since the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Godly govern governance, or hakamiya, is ruled according to Islam. As you can see, um, Qutb does not mean jahiliya, uh, but Qutb does not mean that jahiliya is ungodly in an exclusively Islamic sense, um, even though his teleological vision of society is a specific articulation of Islam. Um, on the contrary, he refers to any state in which society falls into this jahiliya, um, whether it's a society that considers itself Islamic or not. Um, it's any condition where a misguided or corrupt version of religion allows God to be replaced with a human-centric vision and rule. Um, so he gives further examples, such as the case of the medieval Christian church putting, its place, putting itself in the place of God, uh, which is also what he considers jahiliya. It is important to be able to politically charge reappropriation of the term jahiliya in the context of other available terms that refer to the reorganization of the relationship between religion, the state and government, and the public sphere. The term almania um, has a prominent place in Qutb's vocabulary, but it's the concept of jahiliya that dominates as a contrast to the absolute rule of religion. And that's the term that he centers in his writing, jahiliya. He introduces the topic for a historical narrative in which, according to him, Christian, Zion Christian Zionist colonialism defeated Ataturk in a quote, annulling the Islamic caliphate and severing religion from the state, declaring it a completely secular state, and he uses the term Almania here, namely non-religious or Ladinia. Although this definition of the secular as a severing of the state from religion and seeing the secular as the non-religious can seem like a flattening of a more complex definition of the term, it is significant in naming what it was that Qutb found so threatening. The implication here is of a non-religious government, though other writings show that Hakamiya also involves the sensibilities of the public. It is a recognition of a similarity between the secular and jahiliya that Qutb uses as the basis of his argument. Quickly leaving the term Almania behind, Qutb moves to rely only on the term jahiliya as the, uh, the target of his argument. This use of terminology is rhetorically important because it evokes what a Muslim audience would necessarily find objectionable, the pre-Islamic era of ignorance that is the opposite of Islam. Qutb's <coughs> contention, his redefinition of jahiliya, that is that it can occur at any time, not just chronologically before Islam, and that stands in contrast to prevalent historical definitions of the term that tie it specifically to pre-modernity. Secularism is thus an instance of jahiliya albeit a more complex one than that of the pre-Islamic era. Henceforth, Qutb refers to secularism as the miserable break, as the saw as from state of state for religion. His discussion is not limited to the realm of Islam, as I mentioned. Qutb notes that this miserable break occurred in Europe as well, and he points specifically to the medieval Christian church's condition, in which, I quote, Leaders pressured the people in order to condemn the Catholic Church using every means, the most important being exposing the clergymen 
and revealing the secrets of their personal lives that they hid under their clerical gowns. And church rituals. Then came the big divide, which led to the, which led to the miserable break, and religion and political life in Europe were separated. This was the worst crime that the Western church has committed against itself and against Christianity, and in the final analysis, against all religion on earth. Kutub cites excommunication and use of indulgence bills in the name of religion as examples of such abusive practices, saying further that the church, and I quote, deprived every mind outside of the church, and quote, from knowing God independently. The church, in other words, put itself in the place of God. Jahiliya can also be a society wherein science takes God's place and becomes akin to a powerful idol. Whereas classical Islamic thinkers commonly said, science or knowledge is from God, the church had a very literal interpretation of the Bible that did not accommodate scientific discoveries, seeing them as a threat, and thus forcing an opposition between the church and science. Kultub sees science as potentially positive and able to be in line with his vision of a divinely based society, i.e. one that's not inherently idolatrous or opposed to God. This is conditional on science being not a source of worship, but rather <coughs> part of God's creation. As you can see in this quotation. Kultub uses religiously charged terms in his description of the scientific revolution, calling science a fitna, literally a temptation but also the term used to refer to any upheaval, sedition, or chaos that threatens the Islamic community, usually from within, as in the case of civil war. To quote of them, the church alienated its people by replacing God with itself, and science was used as a means of escaping the corrupt church's grasp. Restoring science to its place as part of God's dominion is yet to be achieved and recognized. As such, science is seen as a system separate from God's rule, and thus a kind of jahiliyyah. Communism is also Jehovah to quote because it replaced religion, and American materialism is likewise Jehovah because it has people worshiping various gods, including fame, money, pleasure, and other contracts, constructs of this world at Dunya. In other passages, Kultu rejects the presence of science in religious books altogether, since scientific understanding is always changing. What people understand at any given moment in time is no match for the sacred. However, if the sacred realm is the only one in an ideal society, one wonders where scientific knowledge could indeed fit. For example, Islamic sources, including the Quran, suggest that during the Jahiliya period, the Arabs recognized a creator deity they called Allah. But that they have given Allah the so-called partners that is compartmentalized his role in their lives and displaced them of his authority by bestowing it on other false deities. In other words, Allah was present but played a limited role in their lives and customs, much in the way that secularism does, not ostensibly aim to destroy religion, but to compartmentalize it and limit its influence. Kultuf ultimately saw the modern jahiliya of secularism as eclipsing religion altogether and defacing God, and therefore much more dangerous than the original historical jahiliya, which relegated God to one among a category of deities. For Kultu, the purpose of providing a historical survey of Jahiliya, as he does, ultimately leads to a condemnation of modern colonialism, specifically because of its reorganization of the role of religion in Egyptian society, and which Talal Asad in his study outlines with respect to legal discourse and codes. So Asad's study is focused on the institution um, the, of the legal history of Egypt. Um, Kultu sees the goal of these colonial powers as being, and I quote, to displace Islamic Sharia from being the sole source of legislation, replacing it with European legislation, and that derived from your and that was derived from European legislation, while restricting the Sharia into this narrow, closed-off corner, the corner that came that they came to call the law of personal matters, this small, feeble tail of an animal that they don't even tolerate nowadays. Now they are back at it, attacking it and wounding it in preparation for a complete annihilation of it. How then do Kultub's elaborations on the idea of a non-historically bound jahiliya compare with the concept of secularism? Both are deviations from the rule of religion, and both are efforts to remove religion from the public sphere. 
Also, uh, discussions of Almania are general enough so that it is difficult to locate the concept in relation to Jahiliya. However, his understanding of secularism is focused on a fear of religion being eliminated altogether. Jahiliya is a broad category that refers to any situation wherein God is replaced with another category, essentially becoming a situation akin to idolatry. Um, and it implies that God is akin to the pre Islamic pagan worship that was ignorant of the divine oneness of God. In this way, Qutub's descriptions of Jahiliya are not secular after all, but rather the repeated replacement of one term for another in an idolatrous blindness to the oneness of the divine. The examples of materialist and scientific Jahiliya show that Qutub is not concerned only with a governmental role, but also with society's general sensibilities and value system. The two are seen as inextricable, part of an overarching belief system that is articulated through the government, cultural norms, and societal behaviors. Any of these can then exert a positive or negative influence on members of society. According to Plato's account, Jahiliya does not end up separating religion from national political life, but rather replacing religion altogether. In its latest incarnation, that is, imperialist-inspired nationalism, Jahiliya relegates religion to a limited sphere of family law, where the home is perceived as a temporary step in the project of, once again, replacing the role of religion with another term. What this replacement of religion shares with previous forms of Jahiliya is clear privileging of human knowledge over God. Underlying Plato's vision is a belief about how humans behave in society in general, in which a stable compartmentalization of religion is as untenable as it is undesirable. The traces of the secular can therefore be detected in post-colonial Islamist writings and are indeed constitutive of it. And here I'm skipping some parts that are part of the larger article um, that rely on um, an understanding of Bilal Asad's study of only the court system in Egypt. So the conclusion is that one must not only look for the secular in obvious places such as institutional and governmental discourse, but um, because that would overlook the complex popular currents of thought that still existed and were as vibrant as reactionary as ever. In addition to the case of institutional hierarchy, histories like that of the Egyptian court documents, the secular is detected in various discourses as a symptom of the far-reaching consequences of modernity itself. Otherwise, it would be difficult to read Plutarch's writings and not feel the enormity of the discontent and indignation as he toils to restore, at least textually, the sovereignty of Islam, and to lift the scars that Europe's colonial modernity visited upon the Arab Muslim world. Perhaps it was an extreme task, but the point is that Plutarch was writing against his lived experience of what he understood to be the secular and its attempted implementation. Plutarch's writings show that the way these constructed Western categories of the secular and the religious are rhetorically translated in a strongly reactionary discourse. The fact that Plutarch seems to have had an understanding of these Western categories, even as he addresses them in uniquely Islamic religious language, provides a testament both to the hegemonic authority of the Western conception of secularism and to its cultural limitation. While Plutarch's usage of Jahiliya and Hakamiya shows the way in which the conception of the secular leads to a reification of the religious or the sacred, his writings tell a different story about the role of religion in Egyptian society than one would understand from reading Asad's account of Egyptian court history alone. Asad's account concretizes and apostatizes his very thinking on the secular, while paying less attention to the imperial nature of the <coughs> institutionalization and the power relations involved in it. Um, the institutional perspective is only one part of the political sphere, especially in a divided environment like colonial, not to mention post-colonial Egypt. An understanding of secularism in modern Egypt will always be confronted with an elusive and multiple public. A study of St. Plutus thought provides an example of how non-institutional discourses can tell quite a different history of the secular and its reception in Egypt. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes for discussion. Please. Name the speaker to whom you are addressing your question. The floor is open for questions. So, I have a question. Okay, I'm going to speak with you. Uh, start first with the speaker. Uh, first speaker.
talk about different stories, and I'm just trying to understand exactly what is the connection between all of these different stories. Like, for example, going from Alain uh, Aswani to Karina Gidna, uh, Lignum, so on the business story. What, is, uh, what are the concepts that you're looking at? Are at uh, the concept of justice versus inequality? Are you looking at the concept of revolution against tyranny? So that's the first question. My second question goes to the second speaker. In your study, it seemed like you have uh, held a comparison between two different types of administrative systems. The old Ottoman administrative system, represented by the Khalifa or the Khalifa, and then the second one represented by the Sultan. So, did you come in your study to any sense that it was a matter of replacement of uh, the Semisna, who was a democracy, like, for example, you mentioned that uh, the council <coughs> and the parliament? What about that procedure that you would that it would be used that to elect or to select those members of the of the parliament in the council? Uh, this is the first question. Uh, the second question deals with uh, a model, the meaning of model. How do they respond to the critics that they the use uh, of the word Maruf uh, by the right by the political thing that you have uh, 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 referred to? will be considered ambiguous uh, because what it does do, it takes a religious concept that has been actually uh, uh, narrated in the Holy Quran, uh, recited in the Holy Quran first, and narrated in the Hadith, uh, and then you give it that uh, a separate meaning. Now the third point was regard to a nest and a lot, the earth, talk about the earth and the people. Now if you talk about the changes that are having the earth. Now, it is not possible that the, that the earth is going to change without the people bringing the change to the earth. So in reality, the earth does not change by itself. But in, in fact, it is the people who are bringing that, the change to the earth. That, that, that's what I want to The last speaker was regard to the difference between al-Ilmaniya, as we call it in Arabic or Sakharism, and al-Jahiliya. As Sayyid Qutb has referred to it, would you agree that from Sayyid Qutb's point of view, and many of be considered the minimum level of Jahiliya, and Jahiliya would be the extreme sport of al -Maniyah. And looking today at what's happening in the Middle East, in a place like Egypt, the country that you have referred to in your study, would you consider the call for creating a civil democracy from Sayyid Qutb's point of view a form? of return to an exemplary, to even a worse form of Yahya than the one that he was referring to in the big side here. Thank you. Yes. Parliament is formed. Maruf, um, 
Yes, of course, that is the biggest criticism. I mean, and that is the most critical uh, thing that they do by playing on that the, the terms Earth, Aruf, and then making it more wider and more powerful than most classical traditional Islamic <laughs> scholars would, would accept. Normally, yes, in a more uh, Islamic or Islamist stance, you can't uh, put Aruf ahead of Nas. The divine comes first, as say, the same as actually. We were about to point it down last night. Uh, but by, for them, uh, the changing conditions, yes, and as, as you mentioned, the conditions change in, among the society. The society changes, and that leads to a change eventually in the longer term. Uh, but that is where they've had a lot of criticism in the literature, too, at their time, especially the Ziyari Ukrat was fiercely criticized by the more traditional Islamic scholars, uh, saying that Nas comes first. And that shapes our power has to be in harmony with the uh, mass. So it's a long thing. So to address the first question about the difference between Armenia and Jehovah and whether Armenia can be seen as um, a less extreme form of Jehovah and Tosak, I don't see him saying that Armenia is differing in extent or degree from Jehovah, but rather that Jehovah to him is overarching category, that different types of um, systems of people's governance and behaviors on earth, whether it's um, the case of the church or science or secularism, anything that um, relegates God to a, um, a limited realm of society is a type of jahiliya. And to him, they're all corrupt. They're all corrosive to good values in society. And um, of course, that idea to him was um, writing as he was writing in the 50s and the early 60s in Egypt, it was a very salient form of Jehovah, but um, he doesn't differentiate it in degree so much as he um, focuses on calling out Jehovah, what type of Jehovah, and describing how exactly it is corrupt and how it corrupts Islamic morals and values in society by relegating them to a particular place. So here I'm drawing on Talal Asad's um, complex study and definition of the secularism of secular, um, the doctrine of secularism, um, which, to put it simply, is not eliminating religion entirely, but rather um, relegating it to a limited sphere within society. So, to come to the course, that's, um, that's a corrupt way of living because it doesn't allow religion and religious law to govern how society works overall. Um, and to address the second question of um, civil democracy in today's Middle East, um, as whether it's a a worse form of Jehovah than um, the historical Jehovah of the Islamic society. Or close of, I think that um, it would be safe to say not just the last night. It depends how civil democracy or any form of democracy is carried out, and that the way that um, any non or any type of government is carried out is secondary to whether it allows um, Islamic law and Islamic morals to dictate. Um, any circumstantial governance. Um, so Brooklyn, he doesn't focus on any specific type of governmental rule. His bottom line is that if it's not in accordance with, um, with Sharia, it's not a legitimate form of rule for Islamic society, that people living inside that society can, can no longer call themselves Muslims, which is, of course, a very radical statement. But I need to remember that he's writing in the 50s and the early 60s in Egypt. and. Um, Clearly, that for someone from his standpoint, um, and for him in particular, as a radical thinker, that it could seem that religion, uh, that the people who are ruling the society are trying to eliminate religion altogether, which is a very scary prospect. Next question, please. Yes. Yes, I see your question, Mr. Friedman. Um, just uh, looking at the book, the future of the Mustaqbal to this day, what it means the future to this religion. What it means the dominant religion will be this one religion of the world. My question is a simple one. Uh, have you come in your reading or research? Across any reaction of Christianity or Judaism of this 
great that stated blessing. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Just to clarify, you're talking about a reaction to the phrase Jahania? No, not Jahania. Talking about like now he's saying that the future to this deal which is the future for Islam. It means at the end the world will be dominant by Islamic religion. I'm sure there are some reaction to this phrase that said God has put by either Christianity or Judaism, which is the three big religions, Islam, Christianity and Judaism. Other religions, I'm sure there are some, but these two we can talk about. What are the reactions which you have come across to this kind of uh, thank you. So my research has focused on uh, the primary source of cultural writings as well as on um, anthropologists and other theorists of religion today. So I haven't focused on um, other religions' uh, reactions to the term or to this thought in particular. Um, but I would imagine that there would be a, a wide variety of reactions just, um, just from different thinkers within each of those religions. Yes, please. Thank you. My question is also to Rachel Freeman. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Very good. Um, I was wondering, probably you're aware of what's in your research or slide uh, In your article, the, probably if you have a more of the uh, discussion on that, not necessarily a question, but you are in your uh, in your in your presentation. You are framing anti-side um, uh, utilization of certain uh, secular concepts uh, in, uh, in an ideological wise way to make a very reactionary argument. It looks in your in your article makes a quite opposite argument and says uh, a side could utilize uh, secular and and Islamic to make uh, an argument for political resistance based on Islam. Uh, so, I was wondering what you think about that uh, and how, how it will relate to your discussion because I mean, it is not contradicting to uh, the uh, analysis of cycle, uh, but complicated in a nice manner. So, I was wondering what you think about that. Your question. Um, the starting point for the study was actually um, when I was reading Assad's book, Formations of the Secular. I realized that he never actually mentioned schools. So he mentioned some other Islamic reformers, um, such as Rashid and Muhammad um, Abdu, but he doesn't focus on a popular or non institutional um, level of um, thought. And so when we read his case study in Egypt, but also his, um, his study um, at large, we see that he focuses on an institutional discourse and the history of institutions. And what I wanted to show is that because he neglects puts it all together, that would have been a really um, one example of how that looking at non-institutional narratives and histories in Egypt, um, because that's the example that he gives, um, would have shown a, a very different side to the history of how secular and secularism were received um, or subjected <coughs> History of Egypt. Um, so the starting point was really that he, I didn't see him discuss it, but to either in that study or in his other studies, um, and as a broader point to show that uh, the institutional focus that he has, while it provides insight into um, one facet of how secularism and the secular were received in Egypt, that there, there's a lot more going on, especially because, um, because in the wake of imperialism and when new laws were being implemented in court systems. That was not fully reflective of popular levels of thought, and um, Sayyid Qutb represents one very popular, um, if not totally accepted, but that he's a famous and widely read and widely discussed um, thinker whose ideals and vision of society were not reflected on an institutional level. So if we only look at institutions, we miss out on a large part of the history. One last question. I just have one comment.
more of a, a comment, really. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers for giving us wonderful uh, food for uh, you know, thought, uh, all three of you, uh, specifically the, the sector, whether it's dealt from a non um, textual or primary text point of view, uh, with Dr. Kahl's introduction of the, the popular uh, literature and how literature goes to inspire uh, um, changes uh, throughout history. Thank you. 
later on in later uh, discussion. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thank the speakers. I thank those who asked questions. The session is over. 20 minute coffee break. Thank you. <laughs>